Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is uh, Dennis Dimmick. I'm the executive environment editor at National Geographic magazine. Um, I'm an Oregon farm kid who studied agriculture in college, and, and it, it is an incredibly wonderful experience to be able to stand before you today to see uh, food and agriculture on the cover of National Geographic magazine. We've been working on this project for several years. <laughs> And I want to thank editor Chris Johns for his support, just so we know he too is an Oregon farm boy who studied agriculture in college. So the question really is why food now? And what my purpose is today really is to uh, go through that, but also to give you a quick rundown of what we're about. And to understand why food now, we also need to take a look at some of the larger global issues that the, the world faces and that National Geographic itself has been covering. Climate change, 10 years ago, 74 pages in, in one issue, uh, disappearing ice, uh, the global energy conundrum, special issue, we've covered energy heavily, biofuels, how do you grow fuel without compromising the food system? Um, energy, the, the, uh, here, fracking just last year, it, uh, climate, energy, water, population, food, they're all linked. We, we published a special issue on the global freshwater situation in 2010, and in 2011, we published a year-long series on population, its uh, potential, and the implications of nine billion people at mid-century. But we've also been covering agriculture. In 2008, we put a story on soil conservation on the cover of the magazine. It took nine years from the time I wrote the first proposal. Just like soil, it takes good things take a while to build, right? <laughs> but what we, one thing to come out of this is to understand clearly that the soil that you inherit, the soil in your country is so profoundly significant in the success of your civilization. As you look here, the woman in Mali with her family or the woman in China, guess who has the life with more productivity? Or here, the deep soil in Kansas versus the shallow rocky soil in Syria. It's almost right here, a visual indicator of headlines that we read but it's a changing world that we're in. And we covered this kind of dimension as it relates to food in our population series in 2011. Here, Carrie Fowler of the Global Crop Diversity Trust in Svalbard. What behind him is a seed bank that is, that is positioned high enough on the side of a mountain so that when all the ice on the planet melts, the seeds, in, the seeds in that vault will still stay dry so that we can continue to grow the crops that we all need for civilization to continue and thrive. We covered this emerging food crisis in June of 2009. Joel Bourne is here today who wrote the story for us. This was during the food price spike, of, after the food price spike of 2008. And it was a harbinger for the kinds of issues that we're trying to expand on today. And the underpinning issues are going like this. Well, we have more people. And just over 100 years ago, there were 1.6 billion of us. And 100 years later, we go from 1.6 to 6.1. Move forward another 13, we're at 7.1. And this is the latest projection from the UN. That's a lot more mouths to feed. But we're, also eating, but we're also eating higher on the food chain. So we're, we're, we're using our landscapes to grow crops, to feed animals and cars and to make sugar. And we're, and, and we're shipping, this is soy to an international market. We're feeding a rising demand for animal protein. People want to live like us. And so they're wanting to eat like us. And that has profound implications for landscapes, for for soil, for water, for energy, but also this. This is the big unknown, and all we know is that it is in play. And all, let's just take a look at the Arctic ice cap in slightly more than 30 years. This is September of 79, the first year that the satellites took a picture of the ice cap in slightly more than 30 years, half of it's gone. 
This is the most dramatic visible geological shift that we've seen in human history. It has profound potential to have an impact on the potential of agriculture and the way we live. And the studies now scientifically are focused on what impact changes in the Arctic on uh, mid-latitude weather. And here, looking forward, this study by Ross Naylor and David Battisti that was in science in 2009, looking forward, trying to figure out, as long as we keep burning coal, oil, and gas at the rate we do, what are summers going to look like? And the red is hotter than it's ever been, and this is only a few decades ahead. But then by the end of the century, lots of places are going to be hotter than they've ever been. That, that's a big question mark for agriculture, especially rain-fed farming that relies upon uh, adequate supplies of precipitation coming at the times we expect. So that's why food now. But beyond that, what we're trying to do is to start a conversation. We have up to 40 million readers worldwide. We have a global community of editions. And what we're trying to do is to reconnect eaters and farmers and just to try to get this idea of where food comes from, what it takes to make it happen, and how it happens with people so that they're not just thinking about it when they occasionally read a, an article every five years about, say, reauthorization of the farm bill. And so, I'll walk you through quickly what we have, our opening story uh, written by Jonathan Foley, who I will introduce to you in a moment. This question of how can we go about finding a balance between big and small? Where's the middle ground? What can we do? And we, and we illuminate this through the magnitude and the scale of the operation, the intensity, and the profound transformation that agriculture, essentially one of the world's largest activity, has done to our planet. But on the other hand, come to meet the people who grow our food. It is on one hand intense, intensely huge, on the other hand, it's farming and food is personal. And so we want you to meet the people who devote their lives to growing the food that we all depend upon every day. It's a personal activity. Uh, next month, we will take a look at aquaculture, the role of farming of the sea and of the waters. We've farmed the, the continents for uh, thousands of years. What potential for protein from the sea and from our inland waters? Here, for example, this is a chart that shows feed conversion ratios for you ag majors. It's really an important kind of thing. How many pounds of protein do you get for how many pounds of feed? And what you see over on the far right is fish are pretty good. 1.1, 1 .1, uh, 1 .1, not bad, a pound uh, and a tenth of feed for a pound of protein. Uh, Robin Hammond is here. He will give you great detail on this story uh, soon. I will just lightly touch on it. It's the role of this emergent uh, impact of uh, colonization of lands and other continents. Its shorthand has been called land grabs. What we're looking at is what is the potential for the continent of Africa to feed itself and to become a contributor to the global food supply. And Robin will go into greater detail with you, transformation from a medieval landscape to uh, uh, this kind of agricultural landscape. So we can't just turn the lens on the rest of the world, we must turn the lens on ourselves too. And here in the United States, the question is, why are there more than 45 million people on food assistance? Why is this happening in rural America, in urban America, and in suburban America? We know the issues are complex and the answers are not easy, but we need to at least raise this so people can think about how we can create a better future for our own brethren. Here, a map showing uh, where hunger as a percentage of the population is higher than in other counties. As we move ahead through the rest of the year, the presentation becomes a bit more skeletal, but you'll get the idea that we're going to talk about how diets have moved from from, from ancient hunter-gatherer to herder, and the idea that cooking is what really made us human. It's actually transformed us. It gave us big brains and smaller bellies, and it created an amazing array of foods and diets that we have all come used to uh, and taken for granted. 
And the role of meat is a big question when we talk about resources. Uh, this is, these pictures are from Texas where we're taking a look at the culture of meat in Texas, but this, the story that we write is going to try to confront all of the, the implications and the complexities of the reliance on animal protein and what that means not only for our own health, but for the health of the planet. Uh, climate is so essential here because it's the question of what role drought in agriculture. And so what we will do in this story is actually take a look at lessons we can learn from a prior drought to inform future decisions, especially as it relates to agriculture and crops. How can, what can we learn from the past? And we're gonna focus on genetics and the, and the process of building better plants. What role can that play? We're now breeding by genotype, no longer by phenotype. This is the genome of a sunflower seed. And now we can take ancient breeds of wheat and cross them back using genotype breeding with modern varieties to build in new qualities of re resilience, drought resistance, and productivity. Here at Erie in the Philippines, this is is drought tolerant rice and this is a new emergent c4 rice it's called where the study is trying to uh, take the photosynthesis gene from corn and transplant it into rice to improve uh, uh, drought tolerance water efficiency and productivity and the last will be a piece on sustenance sacred sustenance food is the center of our civilization we gather around the table every day. It is, the, it is a, like the hearth of human civilization. The story of food is more than just productivity and technology and science and policy. It's also about culture and it's the thing that keeps us, us civilizations. But a meal is, not with, is nothing without its condiments, and so we are going to also serve up smaller things like the diversity of apples and the history of forks and food miles, right? Where does all this food come from and how far does it travel? But then we also have meals ready to eat, and what are those like? Now, now that's an evolution of diet, is it? And this is all, as Gary has pointed out, is, is all coming together on our website at natgeofood.com. Constantly updated with uh, uh, news reports, uh, bloggers. One example here is uh, Jim Richardson, who photographed the portraits in the May issue that you have, has written two blog posts about what it was like to go out into the field and, and meet the farmers with the help of the scientists from the CGIAR. We have food bloggers uh, here. Jose Andre, who is here today, uh, is highlighted up there. And as Gary said, across the society, we have a variety of initiatives channel, exhibit, books, Geography Awareness Week, and this weekend we have a food hackathon. And you can find all of this at natgeofood.com, hashtag the future of food. 